Hi, I'm Daniel Stone. I'm the graphics lead at Calabra and talking to you this evening and a couple of weeks ago from uh, wonderfully sunny London. Um, I'm here to, to talk about synchronization um, and all of the the weird and wonderful ways um, that we manage to to actually get some pixels to to your retinas. In more useful terms, um, what that means is we'll be walking through through the whole pipeline um, that we use to to render um, things, to transfer all of the graphics we've rendered between uh, different processes and different contexts and devices. Um, how some of that's implemented in the kernel, which is probably <laughs> a lot more odd than, than you'd expect. Um, and then looking into some of the work we're doing to support some of the future use cases in terms of users, APIs, hardware, everything. Um, and then also what this means for how we actually present in the user space as sort of stepping one level back up. So our first starting point is DRM and not the digital rights management, um, but actually it's the direct rendering manager. Um, and this is our interface between user space and the GPU hardware. Um, and again, we're starting really, really simple. We're starting completely dumb. Um, we're assuming we have a single device. It's got one command queue, which is completely FIFO. It's completely coherent. Um, this is a complete lie as far as hardware goes today. And it's not the first lie I'm going to tell you, but it's easier to build up the model and to understand things that way. And then we can uh, stick on some of the more complex uses and some of the developments we've had over the past 15 to 20 years. Um, yeah, the thing to know about DRM is that that's, that's how we actually interface with uh, GPU hardware from user space and also within the kernel. But <clears throat> unlike something like, um, you know, say a storage device where you have NVMe on uh, the bottom end and then you have POSIX APIs on the top end, um, we have none of that. You know, <laughs> the, um, all of the device operations, everything from allocating memory, executing commands, checking on synchronization, even enumerating device capabilities. Um, that's all done through device specific IOPTALs. So, um, all of the user space you see is device specific. There's no very, very low level bare metal, um, just render this triangle, uh, because we don't have that kind of lingua franca for GPUs. So in graphics, we use Mesa as the canonical example for OpenGL and Vulkan implementations. Um, and we really, we're very insistent on having open user space, preferably in something like Mesa, um, just because without having that, that open user space, we can't actually understand how the driver works um, because it's all tied up in these device specific functions. Um, but that's mean, that being said, let's pretend that we have this, this abstract, very straightforward GPU, um, and just have a quick look at how we actually go about using it. So anyone who's ever had to write a bootloader will know that most of your first, um, first work is just stepping through, uh, getting increasingly more capable with the ability to address and allocate memory. Um, and you sort of have this elaborate bootstrapping routine. Um, and it's exactly the same for, for graphics, you know, once you, enumerated the capabilities of a GPU and you know what you want to do with it, the first thing you're ever going to do is to, to allocate yourself some memory. Um, and this isn't malloc or vmalloc or kmalloc or anything. Um, we have specific carved out uh, buffers um, for GPU memory. And that's just user space requests us that we allocate a certain run of bytes. We allocate it for user space. And we hand it back what we call a, a BO, which is just buffer object. And all the BO is, as far as the kernel's concerned, um, is just a pointer or a set of pages and a size. That's another lie, but you know, we'll come back to that. Um, but BOs are, you know, the obvious ones are your actual pixel data, right? So the textures you want coming in as your sort of input graphics data, um, you know, the user supplied stuff, and then your frame buffers and render targets coming out of what the GPU is actually rendered for you. Um, but there are quite a few more different types of BO, um, things like the GPU state, which is both read and write, um, the compiled shader programs that we ask the GPU to execute. Um, they're all encapsulated inside BOs. So yeah, the, the memory that we do allocate for, for BOs to, to back them, um, that can be done either in, depending on the driver's choice, either in system RAM or in, you know, some kind of dedicated video RAM on some systems that may be from CMA, a physically contiguous cutout. Doesn't really matter. Um, 
the allocations are done on a sort of device global ba uh, basis. So the the device tracks all of the allocations across the entire device, and then it surface, surfaces this to user context just through an integer handle. So every time user space wants to use a BO, it will address that BO by the, the handle it's been given. Um, yeah, this is usually just as you'd expect, an, an array of page structs or an array of DMA addresses or um, however it's been allocated, just that, that fundamental <laughs> memory addresses. Yeah, just a, a dead simple diagram here. It's, you know, the handle, the integer handle just refers down to the device's core um, tracking structure for the BO, and that's what sort of conceptually wraps the pages. The handle is just an identifier. Right, so now we've allocated all our data, you know, we've, we've got our inputs, we've allocated our outputs, we've allocated space for the state and the shaders to run. Um, the second device-specific IOPTL you're going to hit is command submission. So you can tell the GPU to actually <laughs> go and do something, please. Um, all of the command submission IOPTLs are fairly different depending on how the GPU is actually built and structured, um, which varies not only between different vendors, but wildly between uh, different generations as well. So as is tradition, we end up having all these kind of sub drivers with APIs that look more or less similar depending on how wild the changes are. But almost all of them will take a, a list of buffers annotated um, with whether they are input or output buffers, as well as all of the parameters it needs to know to be able to execute something. Um, and then once we have submitted the command, um, the kernel just appends it to a scheduler queue, and the next time the GPU becomes free, then that's the thing we'll execute. And then into our glorious uh, third step of actually seeing what it is we've rendered. Um, buffer access is also frequently a device-specific IOPTL, um, so you'll give it the, the buffer you want to access, the area you... <coughs> so yeah, similar to the DMA API, we'll give it the buffer you want to access with the, that integer handle, the area, optionally, of the buffer you want to access it, and the access mode as well. Um, then we'll materialize a mapping back into the user space process, so it can just access it as CPU visible memory, and we've got the triangle that we asked to render displayed in CPU memory. Hooray! Yeah, that's not particularly compelling, and if you want to find out more about how GPUs actually work, then there are lots of good guides out there. But um, the bit we want to get to is synchronization. Um, you know, GPUs are these extremely asynchronous, extremely parallel, uh, very deeply pipelined um, engines, and emitted in all of this lightning quick overview of how you'd go about dealing with them. We haven't discussed synchronization, which is kind of the point of the talk. So one of the things, if we go back to the command submission I described, is they do take a list of buffer objects that the command is going to access and a mode of, of read and write. Um, and that is to allow the kernel to be able to reason about um, exactly what's going to, to go on. Um, so we can do what we call implicit synchronization. Implicit synchronization is basically a lot of hard work to create the illusion that everything going on is completely synchronous and that the GPU is one nice FIFO um, piece of hardware which happens to execute in lockstep with the CPU. Um, so when we called that driver-specific IOPTL to map our gem object into the CPU address space, that quietly stalled for possibly quite a long time, um, just doing a full pipeline stall and waiting for the GPU to complete the last command which touched that buffer um, before we expose it back up to user space. We don't just use this for, um, for sim serializing CPU and GPU either. Um, you know, if it was just that, it'd be relatively straightforward, but we also have to consider GPU versus GPU. Um, for better or worse, implicit sync is what ended up getting partly built out and partly accumulated um, over the last couple of decades, and that's sort of the foundation of, um, of how we share anything between processes and contexts, is this illusion that <laughs> everything's just perfectly synchronized for us behind the scenes. The way that's classically been done is the, hard, uh, the driver sorry, will record for every command, there'll be a you know, a sequence number or some kind of identifier that um, 
it can record and then query the GPU to see if that sequence number, that command, has already fully retired. Um, if it has, then our sync is done. And um, yeah, it inserts stalls both CPU and GPU side to make make sure that there's no write against read or uh, read against write hazards. Um, and everything just behaves like the world is in fact a single FIFO context. So I did say between processors, but I also said that the handles we had were um, local to the DRM context that we created. So <clears throat> rather than having to share contexts, which would end up in your whole system being a single context with multiple clients, um, where we landed was with DMA buff. Um, it's relatively straightforward. It just allows a reference to a BO to be passed between anything, so different contexts, processes, whatever. Um, so yeah, conceptually, really, it's just sort of hoisting that abstraction and the abstraction of referencing, it just hoists that one level further. So um, it's nothing in and of itself. It just points down to um, to a uh, an actual material gem buffer object. Also, we need to share between devices. Um, this is <laughs> just for the things like, you know, you want to be able to um, decode some media and then access it without copies from the GPU or stream your desktop out to show everyone on Twitch how amazing you are. Um, if you look at most ARM systems, the GPU and the display controller are completely separate IP blocks with completely separate drivers from completely separate vendors. So that's something that <laughs> we really need to, to get really solidly uh, locked down quite early. Um, yeah, when I said that GPU memory was special. It's it's not really that special. It is essentially just pages and addresses. Um, so all we do is for every subsystem that wants to participate uh, in DMA buff sharing, it has an import and export API, which looks something like this. Again, it's um you pass a reference through user space through the file descriptor um, to the original buffer. Um, which is materialized by an export ioctal from DRM in this case. And then for vFRL2, we have a, a similar uh, mirrored import ioctal, which takes a DMA buffer file descriptor and magics that into uh, vFRL2's local concept of a buffer, like, you know, vbuff2 or <laughs> whichever, whichever one you're using. Um, and then internally, uh, the DMA buff in the kernel has an ops table, so vFRL2 can go query the exporter and um, ask it for the list of pages, like ask it for a scatter gather table of what's actually backing that memory. Um, and once you've done that, there's no real need to sort of communicate between the two. You can largely just use them as if they were uh, native buffer objects. So despite being really amazing, there's a lot of stuff DMA buff can't do. Um, for one, it's not an allocator and it never will be. Um, it's not a constraint software either, which is essentially what precludes um, it from ever being an allocator. Um, if you look at the external developers conference talks from any of the years gone by, you'll see a lot of talks about generic allocation and trying to find a pathway to get there, but we're still not there. And even so, DMA buff will never be, a, it will be a very much a user space uh, solution and a multi subsystem solution to deal with. But, you know, it's <laughs> it's something. Um, and what it has given us is the ability to share buffers between DRM, V4L2, Wayland, X11, EGL, Vulkan, GStreamer, Pipewire, Vapi, you know, anything where you have essentially external engines doing work is going to be addressable uh, via DMA buff. So it's just sort of our, our universal exchange that we have for exchanging buffer contents without inserting copies everywhere and destroying our performance. Anyway, that is still not about synchronization, but it's a nice parallel. Um, so now that we've exposed to user space this sort of um, portable concept of a buffer which <laughs> can contain some stuff and be addressed by hardware, um, the next logical step is uh, to expose sync operations and sync points. Um, so we also did this as a file descriptor. Um, essentially what happens is your command submission ioctal um, or whatever equivalent you have in your subsystem, which will cause the hardware engine to do work, will return this DMA fence FD. Um, and that will that will represent the completion of the hardware work. Um, it's also, again, it's portable cross-device and, and cross-subsystem. You know, you 
you generate one when you do some work and you consume them whenever you need to synchronize against the completion of that work. Um, <laughs> it signals exactly once when this work is completed and then it will never be anything but signaled again until its last reference goes. Um, and it is guaranteed to signal in reasonable time. So you can't generate a DMA fence for something that might or might not happen at some point in the future. Um, the answer is usually about five seconds in extremis, but you only materialize the fence when you have really committed to the hard, uh, the work to the hardware and you're sure that, you know, short of your GPU hanging or something like this, that work is going to happen and it's going to happen in an amount of time which isn't going to make the user really, really unhappy. So in the kernel, the way fences work is they, they kind of have these two paths. There's an optimistic unshared path where you can create uh, fences and they're essentially just used for accounting and tracked all around, um, and there's no performance impact to this kind of internal mode. In that internal mode, they're essentially just as they were before, still the devices are still synchronizing against themselves, perhaps with some internal fast paths. Um, where we need to break out, so say if someone's requested a CPU side wait um, because they want to know when the GPU is finished for whatever reason, or you have a cross device wait um, because you have some GPU work that you want to uh, consume from a media codec engine, um, so you can sort of speculatively queue it towards the codec engine but tell it to block on the fence, um, that hits this enable signal ring uh, kernel callback in the DMA fence, which tells the driver that uh, the CPU wants to know as soon as that job's fully retired. Um, so you go into some slightly degenerate fast path, you know, switch on uh, queues and make sure that you get that completion notification when it arrives. Um, the only other thing user space can do with it, um, as I was getting up before, apart from importing it, is it can poll on the file descriptor and uh, be notified when it's ready. So it sort of lets lets the CPU sleep nicely um, until all of the work's retired and you're ready to refill it or <laughs> do whatever else you want to do with it. So um, those two are quite related, uh, not just in the slightly confusing choice of DMA name because they don't always imply DMA. Um, every DMA buff uh, has this DMA resv or reservation structure. The DMA reservation uh, just ties a DMA buff to a set of DMA fences. Um, and that allows us to extend this implicit synchronization that um, we already have within the same context um, across different contexts and processes. So when you, as a kernel subsystem, receive a DMA buff, it's your responsibility before you execute or schedule any work against that DMA buff. You need to check the reservation um, to see what other people have, uh, other people have put there as work that they've already queued. And similarly, you know, when you're when you're queuing work, um, you need to to place a reservation as well um, to tell others to synchronize against. And that lets us extend this whole now completely broken FIFO concept, um, not only across GPUs, which are way more complex than we're pretending, but across entire devices as well. Um, so they can synchronize against each other. So this lets uh, both APIs and subsystems, which aren't fence aware, um, still be able to exchange buffers with other processes, but also user space. Um, if anything hasn't been updated yet for fencing or you're bisecting, um, the implicit sync gives us this, maintains that illusion um, and doesn't completely break all your content. So, <laughs> Why, why do we still have this kicking around? Why do we keep extending this illusion to multiple devices? Um, part of the answer is X11. Um, you know, X's model is really not amenable to synchronization and neither is its code base, to be honest. So that's a really hard one to update. But even Wayland, our glorious, shiny, ultimate savior window system, um, that hasn't universally been updated for explicit fence awareness. Um, the reason that hasn't happened is because it turns out it's not actually anywhere near good enough for some of the things we need to do with synchronization and um, and with fencing. And this is where things get a bit strange, a little bit unknown, and uh, slightly into the hand-waving territory, to be honest. Um, 
So Windows has this, this counting semaphore mechanism, or might be called timeline semaphore over there, where, you know, we have POSIX semaphores, which are binary, they're signaled or they're not. Um, Windows has value semaphores where you can, um, your semaphore signaling operation can set the semaphore to an arbitrary value or increment or decrement the value. Um, and then conversely, your weight operation can block on a specific value. So, you know, you can have one weight, which might not be signaled, uh, might not be woken until 10 signal operations have gone past until they set the right number. And, you know, Windows is a very coherent world, right? You know, it's a sort of single unified structure. So they put that straight into DX12. Um, and so as a first class concept, DirectX12 has not just the same, um, the same binary defense mechanisms uh, that EGL and Vulkan have. Um, they have the full, um, the full integer counting semaphores. Um, and because it's in DirectX, there's a lot of games who rely on it, and to be fair, for fairly good reason. Um, so now we've got that in Vulkan too. Um, if you want to know more about those or go into some details, the two talks I can recommend are um, Tony Almeida's covered a lot of the details of the call Windows primitive in doing the new uh, Futex 2 syscall, um, and also Jason Ekstrand covered it specifically from a graphics point of view um, a couple of years ago when we first floated timeline semaphores. Um, and the reason he was able to, to talk about them is because they were so invasive and they were so difficult to um, all of the way that we'd handled synchronization before um, that it was actually put out and run past the Linux community before it formally became part of Vulkan, just so we could understand a lot of the implications a lot better. So, you know, how bad can that possibly be, right? Like, all we need to do is, is fit binary into integer, and, you know, <laughs> you're not going to, to need to account for the full 32-bit integer space of every semaphore. You know, you don't need to blow it out into the world's largest array. We've got good data structures for the tracking sets, and there seems to be a new one every week in the kernel. So how hard can that be? And didn't we already do this by layering on top of DMA fence? another primitive called DRM sync object. And yes and no, um, you know, sync objects were mainly created for performance reasons, um, as well as, <laughs> as always, file descriptor limits, because everything is a file descriptor, but you only have 1024. Um, so sync object, again, gives us this analogous to, to GMBOs, it gives us this two-level um, handling of synchronization points where Firstly, they're created with a context local integer ID, and then you export them to a file descriptor. And it turns out, you know, this ended up being a bit of a stalking horse for a sync object can contain multiple DMA fences, which is how um, sort of the basis for, for timeline semaphores, because now we can say, give me the DMA fence for this semaphore becoming this particular value, rather than having a fence or not having a fence. Um, so, you know, that's got us a fair bit of the way there. But the thing is, as well as allowing for arbitrary int integer values, they also allow you to do wait before signal. Um, you know, games are very, very heavily threaded these days. Um, they throw a lot of stuff out there at a lot of different calls. And traditionally, you know, if you'd have a uh, kind of world loading in one thread, asset loading in a, another thread, local state in another, um, when you needed to reconcile that, you'd basically have a sort of monster tree of, of um, CPU side semaphore weights. And then the only thing you'd do after they fired would be to wake up and then flush work down towards the GPU. Um, so for better or worse, the timeline semaphores we have and we need to support also allow for wait before signal. Um, so not only does that completely torpedo everything we'd said about Fences complete in guaranteed time, so you don't need to think about synchronizing operations between uh, different processes because the kernel will insert stalls for you, essentially. Um, that's no longer true because it might never signal, um, so it's already a giant security issue, if nothing else. Um, definitely a frustration issue, for sure. Um, and it also kind of 
makes a mockery of um, how we allow user space to queue a ton of operations, specify their dependencies kind of transitively by identifying which buffers they're accessing, and then the kind of will figure it out for you. Um, that's really, really hard when you get into things like wait before signal, um, even before you get into, it becomes far more murky um, trying to understand which operation is actually going to trigger which waits. Um, if you're doing things like increments, if you're doing things like a sort of a reset signaling as well, where you um, signal the semaphore at the highest possible value just to try and clear absolutely everything up, um, it all sort of collapses in a heap. Um, not only can you not schedule jobs sort of as a coder to this, um, it gets even worse because all of DRM's memory management is really tied in with the rest of the kernel's memory management. Um, you know, it turns out GPU memory isn't special enough to not get swapped out, um, to not essentially be subject to, to reclaim, or at the very least have some <laughs> fairly horrendous interactions with reclaim. Um, bonus points if you have something like Z swap as well. Um, and that's even before you get to uh, us essentially doing our own swap and paging, where um, memory can move and migrate between VRAM and system RAM depending on who needs it. Um, because without something like DMA buff heaps, we have no way to be able to force memory to be resident at certain places. So we essentially migrate that on demand. And because we've built up this, the kernel will schedule everything for you nice stack where user space doesn't have to overthink it, it doesn't. Um, <laughs> and so all of that gets really interesting because you can't reason about how things are going to execute anymore, which is definitely a problem when you're trying to um, synchronize things. It, it's just really odd. Everything is going in this direction where <clears throat> it all gets a bit weird and a bit less knowable and the foot guns that are given to users are just getting bigger and more treacherous. Um, so the direction that hardware is going and sort of matched by the direction uh, APIs are going, um, it gives you tools like use space controlled memory residency. Um, so you can create very large but sparse sort of virtual textures um, and you know populate those or page those in and out on demand. Um, which makes your GPU side code much more simple, but makes driver author side uh, a bit, bit less fun, to be honest. Interesting, but maybe less fun. Um, and you know, this is only getting further and further extended. So we've moved a long time ago from GPUs having a single command ring. Um, you know, that, that sort of went down a notch to, it was a single command ring, but you could tell it, just give it pointers to um, use space submitted batch buffers and tell it, okay, just go execute this batch over here. Um, it wasn't quite full context, but it was the start. Now we have real contexts and they're still very much a privileged thing. They're still very much mediated by the kernel. Um, and all of the synchronization still globally resolves, um, but we do have genuinely independent and isolated uh, contexts. Um, you know, as part of this, it did take a very long time, but actually getting full MMU isolation between contexts did actually happen. So you could use those relatively safely. And now the direction things are going is that in sort of a similar vein to things like IOU ring and RDMA, um, it's following that trend of the kernel doesn't have to be involved in every single operation, um, you know, rather than sort of submitting these, uh, these individual calls where you cross the syscall barrier every time and you make the kernel do a load of counting. Um, it's about reducing that, that syscall overhead, being able to batch up as much as you can, and sort of just letting the user space free run and the kernel and the hardware catch up when necessary and they can handle their own synchronization. Um, so where we're coming to is that the kernel's just doing more and more accounting, it's adding more and more overhead, the tracking is getting more and more onerous, and the APIs are pushing us to a position now where we can't even necessarily do that tracking with any kind of reliability or confidence. Um, and the hardware vendors really embraced that and said, okay, well, <laughs> let's just go full throttle over here. Um, and the model is very much going towards 
you know, that kind of mediates creating user contexts. Uh, but once they're created, it's very much all yours. It's, you know, your, your free run scenario should not necessarily involve uh, crossing the syscall boundary. You know, you get um, arbitrary command submission into the GPU and uh, you get your signaling and your synchronization uh, also coming back to you and on a polling basis at least, um, coming back to you where you need it. And then the only time the kernel's involved is for similar situations where it you know, needs to manipulate process page tables um, for you know, actually ensuring some kind of resource security. But in, in that free run state, the kernel's just not going to be there anymore necessarily. So yeah, it's um this is largely driven by games rather than whims. You know, um games genuinely need gigantic throughput, you know, thousands upon thousands of, of draw calls that they need to put together. Um it's just it's getting it's getting to a point where the performance overhead isn't manageable. So, you know, that's something even if the hardware didn't push us there, it's we'd have to be working on reducing that overhead no matter what. But you know, in almost opposition to games, uh... we really need to be better at GP, GPU and compute. Um, you know, this is a market which has largely been eaten by CUDA, a completely proprietary solution, but it's a proprietary solution that works really well. Um, it works really well in these workloads where, <laughs> you know, you're rather than your sort of 16 or 11 or 7 if you're fancy millisecond budget that you have to get a frame out in a game uh, sort of closer to weeks for compute jobs you know you've got these giant long running programs absolutely enormous data sets um, that they might need to page in and out and any year now we're going to have a GPU triggered demand page faults um, and much more on the preemptability side as well. Um, and they're very, very, very different uh, uses and demands, but we've got the same hardware at the bottom and we've got the same APIs at the top that, that both of them hit. And we're just kind of nicely sandwiched in the middle. We're not sure what, what that Goldilocks solution is. And, you know, this isn't a presentation of this is the API of the future. I have all the answers. Um, because the only thing we found out last time, um, I don't have any talks to reference apart from the X.org developers conference, which this is getting a bit hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy. Um, it will have happened two weeks ago when this is on. It hasn't happened yet as I record it, but here we are. Um, there might be some discussions at XDC almost the entire year uh, so far on DRI Devel has been dominated by this. There's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of mails um, because we had all of, all of the vendors come into this same tipping point. Um, and all we really found out and concluded in all of that is that the hardware implementation we know the most about right now got it wrong and they don't quite have something workable yet, but all of them are on the cusp of, of having this. So it's something we need to think about and put a lot of work in. Um, and we've started doing some foundational work around a hybrid model. So no matter what the final model ends up looking like in this kind of fully user space controlled, steady run, no one knows anything about synchronization anymore, use case. Um, you get that most of the time, but sort of like DMA fence where I said before that because it was a wrapper around a driver object and essentially a set of interop helpers. Um, it did let you have your own best case internal synchronization um, when that was all that was needed. But as soon as you needed to break out to different devices or CPU side, we'd sort of flip the switch and 
at that point you you take the performance penalty. And the thinking is the same um, for this newer synchronization hardware is that we let it run ahead at full tilt when it needs to, but um, or when it's able to, but as soon as it needs to deal with something which isn't aware of fancy new sync, um, like say an, an older media API or an older window system like X11 or any of these things, um, you know, that's when the kernel would sort of step in at the margins and take a much less performant path, but on the understanding that this is something you would only need to do, say, once per frame. So it didn't matter too much about the performance properties of what synchronization looked like then. And we could eat the overhead of mapping the new world to the old fencing and implicit sync world. Um, because if you wanted to get more performance, then you get to implement the new thing. This is not a design outline because we're not there yet, and the hardware isn't there yet, and user space isn't entirely there yet either. Um, so we haven't got that much time to, to figure it out. Um, you know, we will we will know surprisingly soon, I think, how this is going to shake out and what all of the impacts will be, but we at least know kind of in broad strokes we know the outline, I would say. Then switching tap to something which gets substantially more straightforward, um, but also pretty integral on the display rather than render side of things. You know, these are both conflated in DRM. Um, they both have the same memory access and uh, very similar synchronization models. Um, and displaying stuff is pretty useful once you've rendered it. Um, so yeah, we don't we don't need to worry about too much of this enormously complex but must be enormously performant synchronization model on the display side because it's only a couple of transitions per frame. Um, so that's, you know, we've got less to worry about there. Um, but we also have not the opposite but maybe the reverse concern because display is in a way backwards to rendering. Um, you know, your path of getting pixels onto the display is obviously forward from, from render to display. You know, the, the data you've rendered moves to the display to be consumed. Um, but where all this ties in with synchronization is how we deal with timing, which flows exactly backwards from there. You know, um, through the through the display to the window system to the client is how we derive our timing. Because we have this fixed display clock if we pretend that VRR doesn't exist because that's the thing we're working on but we're not quite there yet um, and to be honest most games don't care about VRR they just want to run it up to full tilt the entire time and they don't care when it is just as long as it's as fast as possible. Anyway in a fixed refresh rate world you know that your your display clock will tick at you know the 16, 11, 7, whatever milliseconds. You know, at each point in time, you know exactly when your deadline is for the next frame. And absent tearing, which you can't do on all hardware and looks pretty horrible anyway, um, absent that, um, you know that if you don't make that fixed deadline in time, then you're going to be one frame late. Um, and that's pretty horrible for, you know, <laughs> games, obviously, but even just the things you wouldn't expect too much, like um, animation, uh, media as well, are quite sensitive to jitter. Um, it's really off-putting. So one of the things we put a lot of effort into squashing was a lot of the cause of that jitter. Um, and we did that by, by having this model where the timing propagates backwards from our known deadline of the display right the way through back to... Um, back to the client with various kind of intermediate deadlines along the way. So yeah, this is, you know, the V-blank model that has existed since the 80s. You know, V-blank hits, you take the interrupt, you draw your stuff, you know it completes in 16 milliseconds, it gets displayed at the next time. Right. I mean, it is brilliant if you can produce content at slightly faster than refresh rate. Um, it's brilliant if you don't mind taking 16 milliseconds of latency. Um, if you search for terminal benchmarks, it turns out that people have opinions about this and their opinions are that 16 milliseconds is not okay. Um, we know that Linux and the open display stack are 
also been used in some extremely time insensitive environments like um, neurological imaging, where <laughs> we have to be really committed and really accurate um, and also really prompt. And we just can't do that extra latency. So already those assumptions that underpin that really straightforward sort of ping pong VBank model have gone. So what we did was um, we kind of slightly abstracted the concept of VBank. Um, so we still obviously have our displays fixed clock. Um, but one of the things we did with Wayland is we added a signal to clients to, to prompt them and say, you should paint now. And the easiest implementation of this, the one we started off with in every compositor, um, was just on VBlank, we send the event and then the client paints then. Um, but it's, it's certainly disconnected from VBlank. Um, it's designed to not be in phase with VBlank. Um, and it may not necessarily even be at the same rate as VBlank. Um, so one of the things having this separation allows us to do, um, is it, allows us to um, cut down the latency because we can take the v-blank and then in the middle of the frame we can say okay client paint now and you know hopefully the say half frame eight millisecond margin is enough for you to make it there um because we know exactly when clients are submitting work and how long it's taking um we know through all of their uh, fences and all of the synchronization information they give us um, exactly what's going on. We can adapt to slower clients. Um, so we can give them an earlier start uh, within the frame boundary. So they're still able to hit that next frame that's just coming, um, but they're given more lead time to do it. Um, if they are just terminally slow, then rather than sort of throttle the whole desktop um, to the slowest client as we have been doing, Rather than doing that, um, what we can do is we can pace them out. So uh, we give them a lead time which is greater than the time of one frame, knowing that they'll be able to, to make the next. We can pace them at a consistent 30 frames a second, which, unless you're a game, always looks much better having that consistent um, frame rate rather than, you know, sort of juttering around, making odd ones here and there, but not not an, at a nice cadence. Um, so the example for that is uh, Michelle's been doing a lot of work with Jonas and the other Gnome and Mutter developers to to implement that kind of adaptive synchronization um, within Mutter and within Gnome Shell, um, and that's something that comes in really really useful because you know <laughs> as I was building up to before we now have completely arbitrary clients who can issue wait before signals um, who can write themselves into completely unschedulable cycles where their jobs will never complete, you know, whatever. Um, so we need to, we've now got this kind of two-stage um, model where we've separated the display tick from when we tick clients. Um, and to solve this, fundamentally there's, there's no way around it since the sync contract is now being broken. Um, to solve this we need to add a third point in this um, frame by frame uh, composition cycle, we need to add this third point, which is a late binding decision point for compositors. So they can accept new client uh, rendering before it's been completed, but rather than taking the client on a complete blind faith that it will complete in time, um, the compositor wakes up just before its deadline and checks, has the work been completely retired yet? If so, that's great, we'll use the new content uh, this frame. If not, we'll stick with the old client content this frame, um, and hopefully next frame, you know, the client will be able to make it. We've learned that graphics is surprisingly difficult, and not in the sense of, you know, animating hair beautifully or water effects that are actually realistic and don't take a month to render out. Um, you know, at the low level plumbing, um, <laughs> we're approaching this horrible, yeah, uncanny valley, I guess, and, you know, sandwiching where um, we have games that want to play just as well as consoles, um, they want to coexist with desktops where an electron notification might turn up and suddenly demand you page out a gig of RAM. Um, they want to do this on cheap laptops. On the other side, we have these relatively low throughput but high execution <clears throat> and high memory demand workloads. Um, 
running on much larger kind of fixed workloads and hardware like we'd seen the network offload in RDMA world. Um, now both demanding the same APIs on the same hardware. But the good news is, yeah, it's, it's got everyone's attention. You know, we're not, um, it's not like these issues aren't known. Um, it's not like they haven't got priority or focus. You know, there's really sort of grabbed us all over the last while. So <clears throat> everyone's been, whilst we wait for some of the details to shake out, particularly on the hardware side, really pushing on a lot of foundational work and a lot of bits and pieces, which might seem unrelated, but build us all up to this future where um, synchronization goes from completely guaranteed to completely unknown. Um, and the good news is we've probably got a while anyway, because yeah, no one, no one can buy GPUs. Um, so yeah, thanks a lot for that. Um, looking forward to, to any questions or discussions or chat or someone pointing out how there's a continuity error because I'm wearing different clothes, uh, when I turn up in the chat. Um, and surprisingly, given everything I've discussed and the industry as a whole, we are hiring. So if this is the kind of thing that interests you at all, then please get involved. Thanks.